Okay, so yeah, welcome again. Um, so uh, let's start with just a few minutes of sitting together and then we'll move into the second um, Dhamma talk, the second talk where we'll talk about, um, yeah, a bit more in depth about Vipassana and what it actually is and why we are using body scanning to practice Vipassana. Um, and what the what the most important principles of the technique are. So, uh, yeah, find your find your posture, your position. It doesn't have to be super formal, but just something that will do for a few minutes. And I invite you just already, even with the eyes open, kind of very casually, to already be aware of your body. So we don't have to take a very formal meditation posture to already start tuning into the sensations of the body. So you might notice some really obvious sensations of the body. Maybe where your body is touching the chair or floor or where your body is touching itself, maybe your hands resting on your legs or lap. And just kind of receive the totality of your experience. What is the totality of your experience? It is anything you're experiencing. And just notice the state of the body in this moment. The state of the body more high energy or low energy? Does it feel heavy or light? Is there a sense of fidgetiness, restlessness, or a sense of stillness and calm in the body? their urge to do something with the body. And just kind of noticing these things, we don't have to change them. And maybe you notice also a certain breathing Maybe the breathing right now is deep or shallow. Maybe it's fast or slow or normal. So we're using our direct experience of the body. the somatic experience of the body. Whatever you can sense and feel. Because the body is an experience. It is not just an object or something we think about and use, but it's actually something that we can directly experience in this very moment. And whatever it is, we are just aware.
and you can just consciously relax a little bit any sense of tightening in the body. So if there is any, if you kind of clench your fists right now, if there is any sense of this kind of clenching fists feeling in the, anywhere in the body, just let go of clenching the fist, just relax the, the hand. And allow the same to happen in the rest of your body. And if some tension remains, that's also okay. And let us stay together at the really the frontier of the present moment. So really just this moment of the body. Not what happened five seconds ago, but what is happening right now. and receiving this. And throughout this session, I just invite you to um, never stray too far from your body. So as you listen to me for the next um, 40 minutes or so, just kind of come back to the sense of your body. And I'll try to remind you throughout the session so that you're never too far, never go too far into thinking, just always recognizing the simplicity of what you are doing with the body, whether it's sitting or um, feeling of pressure or the feeling of touch. Okay, and you can open up the eyes again if you close them. Good, so thank you for that. So the first thing that I want to just ask is what did you notice over the last few days? Anything that has, anything that you've noticed about the mind, the body, and maybe about the effect of meditation or the lack of effect of meditation also, okay. Um, something that you noticed during the last few days of meditating two hours per day. You can just write it in the chat.
Okay. I will just let a few more people write. So there's an increase in concentration or calmness. Um, maybe the monkey is talking less. Um, what else? So there's more alertness during the meditations and less falling into dreaming. Um, Elliot has noticed that there's a lot of thinking that he covers up almost unconsciously. He wants to be heard like a frightened child, but usually remains silent. In meditation wouldn't remain silent. So yeah, some things which we don't usually notice or give time to, we can we can start hearing them. Um, we start seeing actually how much we think. Sometimes um, we feel that when we start meditating, wow, I'm actually thinking more than usual, but it's actually that we are just seeing the thinking more. Because usually we are just caught in the in the doing or in the um, interaction with the outside world. Separation from my thinking. Interesting. What do you mean by that, Sean? You found a separation from your thinking. Well, a sort of um, an ability to notice that it was thinking that it wasn't. It's not me. It's not it's it's equal to let's say a uh, focus on the breath it's you're focusing on the breath mm. and then your thought comes and they're equal they're not neither of you are neither of them are you if that makes any sense yes amazing this is excellent um yes this is exactly where we are moving with this so to recognize we are usually very identified with the thinking. When when a thought comes, we immediately our sense of I am that thought or or that thought is truth is so uh, ingrained. But we can actually start to observe the mind, the body as appearances and consciousness. So they they are just appearing and then they also disappear. So it's the same when we focus on the breathing. So the breathing is an experience that's coming and going. The sensation of the inhale and the sensation of the exhale, the pauses. And it's the same with the thinking. It's not usually when we're caught in thinking, we're so in it and it's the truth, but we start to get the ability to recognize that thinking is just something that's appearing and you see it as you were just describing, Sean. So this is really amazing. And this is the first step actually on the um kind of path that the Vipassana, um, Vipassana outlines, the first step is to be able to separate mind and body and to see mind and body clearly. So mind is the thinking, imagination, memories, and the body is the sensations of the body, sensation of hearing, sensation of seeing. Okay. So let's move towards what is, what is Vipassana? So, in the first few days, we were practicing more. Um, we weren't actually practicing Vipassana. We were practicing more Samatha or Samadhi meditation, which basically means concentration meditation or calm meditation. We have one focus object, which we keep coming back to. And through that, we're building more calm, more focus, um, more ability to discern when we think we are not. Now we start to move a little bit more into the realm of Vipassana and in Vipassana it's not as this focus object is not as important but what is more important is to be clearly aware of what's happening in the mind and in the body so actually we can also practice Vipassanas with thinking um, because when we see a thought clearly and see that the thought is happening in the present moment that's already taking the the kind of Vipassana way of looking the clear seeing of that thought so th thoughts aren't something bad and thoughts aren't something that we need to stop. 
So vipassana um, means um, the prefix uh, vi means kind of through or in or in a special way and pasana means to see. So it's kind of a special way of looking, a special way of seeing, um, a special way of um, noticing experience with clarity. And the word mindfulness comes from the word sati, which is uh, what they use in the Pali texts um, to describe the type of awareness that we are using in, in this practice. So it is to be aware of the contents of mind and body or the seeing clearly of what's happening and experience rather than being caught in our thinking. Um, so I'm curious, what proportion of the time, and you can be super honest, it can be 90% the first one. <laughs> Um, what proportion of time did you think about stuff without really recognizing that you're thinking about stuff? So maybe you're thinking about work or yourself, or memories. Versus, secondly, seeing clearly the mind. So seeing clearly that you were thinking this moment that Sean was describing this kind of, oh, there is thinking happening. Or seeing clearly the body. So maybe seeing clearly the sensations of the breathing or something else in the body. So maybe just assign 100% across these three categories. And there's no right or wrong. We, we are all where we are in our process with it. Okay. So there's a 5% stuff, 90% mind and body, 50% stuff, 45% mind, 5% body. Sure. Nothing wrong. We, we are just uh, cultivating also awareness of how much we are distracted. 30% stuff, 10% mind, 60% body. Wonderful. Okay. So what we want to practice is to move more towards seeing clearly the mind and body and less of thinking about stuff without recognizing we're thinking about stuff. So it's okay to think about stuff as soon as we notice it, the moment it appears. And that will, sometimes that will take a minute, sometimes it will take five minutes before you kind of wake up. Sometimes it'll just take a second. Um, but here's why we have some focus object with the body, because we, we use the body, if we just kind of sat and tried to observe, it would be much more difficult. So that's why we use the body as kind of focus object in the first few days. And we've also got stuff is down to 20%, rest is 30%. Uh, mind and 50% is body. Okay, great. So maybe you're also finding that proportion is changing. You're waking up more often, recognizing more often, and seeing clearly more the mind and the body. Good. So, um, yes, Vipassana is about uh, seeing clearly or seeing the experience at the present moment. We can only practice Vipassana in the present moment, not by thinking about things or in the past or future, but when we recognize the things in the present moment, that's when we start to practice Vipassana. So it actually takes some time to prepare to practice Vipassana because we need to build some level of concentration, some level of ability to recognize the mind and the body. Um, and then we start to practice a bit more Vipassana and, and that practice obviously gets refined and, and built as we progress. And then there's also various traps we fall into along the way where we get stuck maybe if we um, identify too much with being a meditator, but that all comes later. Okay, so now I want to talk a bit about um, what the importance of the body and why we are using specifically body scanning to practice Vipassana. 
Actually, we can we can practice vipassana on anything on the mind, on the body, on the feelings. But in this course, we are focusing on practicing vipassana on the body because it is the easiest and the most important place to start. So we have we have our body and we have our nervous system in the body. Our nervous system is kind of our sensory system, the way we can we can sense and feel the body. Um, so in the beginning, in the meditation, I asked you to kind of check in and feel how is the body? Is there lightness? Is there heaviness? Is there energy or lack of energy? Is there restlessness? Um, is there a sense of kind of activation, a sense of rest? Is there um, maybe the sense of fighting or flight, fear, anxiety? Or maybe there is a sense of resting, digesting. So we know these, these words nowadays. Um, and this is the nervous system, and we can really feel this directly. And when things happen in the outside world, so for example, you know, a very basic example is when we are when we were cavemen, and a tiger jumps out, and the nervous system instantly reacts to this information. So the tiger is um, seen and the nervous system starts firing up and goes into this fight or flight maybe there's intense fear maybe there's a sense of um, energy that comes because we need to mobilize ourselves to fight or to run or maybe we start to freeze but the nervous system is directly influenced by what's happening on the outside world through our um, through our senses and often this happens so quickly we don't even recognize and then we're already in that state um, when we are yeah the nervous system is activated so of course nowadays there's not many tigers around but this is still constantly happening when when we um you know for example if we have to give a presentation and we feel anxious about it and that anxiety is appearing inside the body inside the nervous system and our system, we feel that there's something we're afraid of or something that we're anxious of um or for example, something angers us and we our nervous system fires into anger and we and we quickly, if we notice the feeling of the body in that moment, there's probably heat in the body, there's probably contraction, tightening in the body. And so not only with these very more obvious sensations, but there's constantly a feeling in the body, whether we're at rest or whether we're doing something, there's always a feeling of, of the body and the state of the nervous system of course this also happens with the other side with the good side so when something happens that we want or something amazing or beautiful there's also something some feeling inside the body which is good so maybe uh, someone gives you a compliment hey uh, you guys have been amazing job at meditating and you're, you're doing so well and maybe there's some feeling inside the body Maybe some smile appears or some um, usually in the pleasurable feeling is a bit more expansive, a bit more soft. Um, um, so, for example, when we feel love, usually we feel that in the around the heart area, the nervous system around this area. So reflecting that. The thing is, we can't really tell the difference or the body can't really tell the difference between when things happen on the outside world versus when we're just thinking about things. So most of the time, we just think about things and that affects our nervous system. So let's say we, th we worry about what's going to happen tomorrow and then the nervous system goes into a state of worry and a state of maybe anxiety or a state of uh, tension in order to get things done. Um, or we think about something wonderful that happened and there's also something pleasant in the in the system which gets reflected. And usually this whole process is happening below a conscious level. So we are just, we are playing with the outside world and the meaning of the outside world. So we are thinking about the world and then um, makes us feel a certain way and we start interacting with the world from that place without having the awareness that these things are happening right here inside the body. And usually we just react to them so if it's good we react with wanting more of it 
If it's bad, we react with pushing it away with whether it's anxiety or with it's anger or um, reaction. So what we want to learn to do <clears throat> is to be aware of these things as they happen in the body and to cultivate a sense of just being aware of it. So just like in the beginning, I just asked you to be aware, <clears throat> asked you to be aware of the feeling of the body, but not necessarily do anything about it yet. And when we cultivate that space within us to be able to feel things without straight away jumping into a reaction um, <clears throat> of it, so maybe this tightening and contraction without jumping straight into acting or reacting, we just feel those things. And then from there, there's more space to act in a way that uh, you want to. So another question here for you is, do you ever get overwhelmed? Maybe a little bit overwhelmed or just a lot overwhelmed. <clears throat> but when you are overwhelmed, you act in ways that don't really align with what's really important to you or what you really want. Or maybe in <clears throat> interpersonal conversations, maybe it's with yourself, and maybe it's when you wake up in the morning. <clears throat> so a lot of threes and fours. Um, so we feel generally when we are overwhelmed, it kind of it kind of uh, overrides what we how we really want to live our life uh, and we start acting maybe in ways that we regret or that are a bit more uh, more anxious or more angry than we really intend to be in this world when we are more in a chill kind of state or when we are present this tends to happen so <clears throat> not only is this a one-way street of the, the, the world and the mind, the thoughts affecting the nervous system, but also um, when we are in a certain state of the nervous system, we're also interacting with the world from that place. And we are, our thoughts are shaped. And when we're overwhelmed, everything quickly, for example, when we are annoyed and overwhelmed by anger or annoyance, the whole world quickly becomes <clears throat> tainted. <clears throat> Excuse me, tainted with this um, um, this certain state. So a bit like taking on a glasses or a filter through which we see the world. And sometimes we're stuck in that for a few minutes. Sometimes it can be a whole day where we're stuck in that. So maybe you know those days or a morning where things are just going wrong you wake up wrong and something bad happens you drop something you hit yourself maybe on the on the bed and then from then on things start keep keep going wrong and something at work happens and not only do we um, perceive just the negative in that in that space but also we uh, through lack of attention attentiveness and through lack of mindfulness a lack of awareness of what, what we're doing. We make more mistakes. We, um, yeah, we harm ourselves and, and the world at times. <clears throat> so a vicious cycle when, when, it's, when it starts to happen, and these are constantly influencing each other, the, the body influencing the thoughts, the thoughts influencing the body, and the body interacting with the world, <clears throat> what we say, what we think, what we... Um, our actions so here is where we um, cut this cycle with the practice of the pasana so we have our formal meditations twice a day and in, in our formal meditations we are having very specific intention to cultivate a greater level of awareness 
but also to cultivate the sense of equanimity, the sense of everything is okay. And I'm just allowing whatever it is to, to be and to come and to go, to allow and accept the things as they are. So we're already working on this a little bit now with the body scanning. So we are scanning our body and we're continuously cultivating this awareness of the body, of the nervous system. And when things start to happen, so maybe when um, we think about something or we worry about things or um, many, many things will come as, as you see in your meditations, many things are showing themselves, whether it's worry or fear or peacefulness or um, whether you are yeah, anger, irritated or whether you're sleepy or doubtful or drowsy or dreaming or fantasizing, whatever it is that's happening. We are just clearly aware of the mind and of the body. We are practicing Vipassana when we see clearly the, the body and the mind. Excuse my very bad drawing with my touchpad. Heart represents the mind. So we see the mind and the body with clarity. We continue cultivating a deeper sensitivity. <clears throat> so maybe you noticed when you were focusing on your breathing over the last few days, maybe there was more subtlety you were able to pick up, more detail, more smaller sensation. Ah, oh, here's some heat, here's some um, tingling, here's some, uh, here's the pause, here's the break between the breaths, here's the intense, intense phase of the breath. Um, and so also it is with the body sensation. As we start to scan the body, maybe you can feel, ah, oh, here's an arm and here's the touch of a cloth or here's the feeling of my butt on the, on the chair. But then as you start to go deeper, you can start to see, see more and see really the components of that experience. Continue to cultivate our concentration, our ability to, to stay focused on the task. And we cultivate our awareness, our acceptance, our equanimity towards whatever is happening. I was just caught in thinking for five minutes. I see it. I accept it. It's okay. And I come back to perceiving clearly. So awareness, as I, yeah, as I just mentioned, is the, just the sensory experience of body-mind at the present moment the present moment um, experience of body and mind. So we are keeping ourselves busy with this act of scanning and developing the sensitivity, sensitivity everywhere. And we cultivate this habit of keep waking up and seeing clearly the body and mind. And equanimity. Um, this is not something we, this is something that we can do right now. So to kind of have the attitude of being okay with whatever it is. So whether it's, sometimes we get annoyed and then we get annoyed at the fact we are annoyed. So this would not be equanimity. Equanimity would be recognizing ah, annoyance is here. The mind is doing something. Maybe you can feel that annoyance even in the body if you have sensitivity. And we recognize it and it's okay. And then maybe we start to feel annoyed that we are not doing it properly. And that is just another appearance of mind and body. So whatever is happening right now, we allow and accept it as it is at the present moment. And over time, we, uh, this happens more and more and less and less we are thinking and reacting to stuff. Because this thinking is actually proliferated by the reactivity, by the um, pushing stuff away. When things unwanted things happen, we push them away and then the mind is stuck in relating to that. And it actually becomes much more sticky. And when we try to push it away, it, it clings to us. The, the irritation, the anxiety, the worry, the whatever, the doubt, the sleepiness, it starts to stick to us. And likewise, also when we desire, when we think about things that we want to do and, and 
and sometimes it also feels nice and we're fantasizing about things but we are just stuck in thinking and we secretly want more of it but we are not seeing clearly that this is just activity in the mind and in the body yeah and maybe the last thing <clears throat> In Vipassana, we are not just, this is not just some theory that, and that's why it's so important to do the practice because I can tell you these things and they are some, some kind of heard wisdom, some kind of ideas you are hearing and you're okay. You know, that, that makes sense. And maybe you think about it, you're thinking about it now and thinking like, oh yeah, like, okay, this, what he's saying, making sense, this kind of the nervous system and things. But if, if it just stays at that, level of thinking or of hearing about it as soon as we get overwhelmed we completely forget about those things and so that's why we need to practice and make this wisdom from thinking or wisdom from hearing about it into wisdom from experiencing into the direct experience and your personal experience and that's something that only you can do so your personal experience of experiencing your unique mind and body for everyone it's going to be different and to um yeah cultivate this this way of seeing okay so i will pause there and just invite you to sense the body uh, i forgot to do it throughout but hopefully you've been doing it on your own accord And we're going to do a quick, just recap. So I invite you to close your eyes. And just for a moment, just be clear on the body. Today we talked a bit about what is Vipassana. So Vipassana being a special way of looking, a way of seeing clearly. And we talked a bit about the body and the nervous system and how this is always reflecting the conditions in the outside world, but also a condition in the mind what we are thinking about. And of course, also vice versa, the, the body is also, and the feeling of the body and the state of the nervous system is also influencing the thinking, how we are thinking, how we are perceiving the world, which in turn um, makes us, yeah, affects how we are interacting or acting in the world. And this becomes problematic when we get overwhelmed when we get overwhelmed with uh, not only in the negative, but can also be overwhelmed with greed or overwhelmed with hatred or disgust or overwhelmed with worry or anxiety, overwhelmed with doubt, overwhelmed with um, sleepiness, drowsiness, lack of activation. And we act in ways maybe that isn't really how we want to. So the practice of Vipassana um, starts to um, reduce some of this reactivity and starts to give us more space and more choice and therefore also more freedom um, through the cultivation, cultivation of just this awareness of what's happening in the body and to be able to allow and accept and give space to that which really prevents us from uh, going to that reactivity or that spiral of overwhelm. Um, and the two main components are the component of awareness, of higher clarity, higher concentration, 
and the component of equanimity, the inner balance of the mind to be equal. We have to make this a experienced wisdom, a wisdom that we are practicing, something that's so intuitive and deep that we don't even need to think about this way of relating. <clears throat> and of course, this is step by step, but each step we continue to learn about ourselves and continue to um, grow in different ways. Okay, so now there is some time for questions about the lecture, about the technique, whatever you like. Um, yes, you can write in the chat, you can speak out loud, whatever you wish. And there's no, there's no stupid questions. The, good, the best questions are honest questions. You don't have to try and impress me or anyone else, but the best questions are ones which you are just curious and honest, honest about. And... Yeah, I have a question. Um, in the context of um, Buddha's core teaching, um, if you think about the eightfold path, uh, mm -hmm. what you see vipassana being a technique for right mindfulness or for right uh, concentration or for both? Both. So in vipassana, we we uh, the technique is is using both. We have to first we have to get the right concentration. We have to get concentration, which is cultivated with the mind and body and with the experience of mind and body. If we go into practicing concentration with something that's extra, like a visualization, a mantra, um, and things, that level of concentration will be much more difficult to bring to the right mindfulness. And what is the right mindfulness? The right mindfulness is seeing the mind and body clearly. The samasati is to see clearly that this is mind and this is body, and to see that. So, um, Especially, especially nowadays where the term mindfulness is thrown around so much, well, most of it is not the right mindfulness. So most of it is not, you know, we are um, mindful of, of something, but it's not really the clear awareness of mind and body. And that's, that's what we're practicing. Here. So it's, um, but Vipassana is more than just right con concentration and right mindfulness. We also have to, to set up the right understanding, the right thoughts, the right intention of, of our practice so that's why these lectures exist to give you a bit more understanding and framework to understand how this actually works because then you will understand how to practice which will then lead to the right mindfulness um but yeah there's there's also other other techniques but this is the way that that i've learned and, and practiced the most and, and what i find um, the best What else is there? Another question which came to my mind today, which is probably more like a question towards the end of this course, if you will, but now that is on my mind, I, I, I want to ask it right now. Um, one, I, I personally find one hour very challenging for me. 30 minutes is actually, right now, 30 minutes for me is the sweet spot. Beyond 30 minutes, it starts to get very difficult in various, uh, both for the body and, and, and the mind. Um, so my question is, uh, my question is twofold. If I would maintain the discipline to at least once in a while go for one hour, would that get any better? And my other question is, if I stick to the 30 minutes, um, 
will that not have the desired effect or is it better than nothing? Yeah, 30 minutes is great. 30 minutes, if you can do 30 minutes uh, at least once, if, if not twice the, the day, in the day, especially after this course, this is amazing. You will make, you will continue to make a lot of progress with this um, amount. And with one hour, you have to face yourself a bit more. So we have different ways that we kind of, uh, let's say, tease out the, the, the reactions in our mind and body. And, and one way is to uh, have a longer duration of the practice. So when we start having longer duration of the practice, the first half an hour, easy peasy. But as we start to sit 40 minutes, 15 minutes, we start to react more, we start to feel more discomfort, we start to feel more impatience, we start to feel more maybe, and then however you react to that, whether it's worry or doubt or anger, starts to come more. And so the sweet spot is where we have to deal with these things a little bit, but we don't get overwhelmed. If we get overwhelmed and we are just circling in that, it's too much. So um, we want to, so if it's, of course, in the beginning, when we're when we're setting the habit and building the habit, we want to make it make it nice. But at, at some point, we should also start facing a little bit discomfort, and in the practice, um, and yeah. So it's kind of up to you how much time you have and how much uh, how much uh, you want to go into that. And it's also okay, you know, for the first year just to create the habit and do half an hour and see see how it develops. And actually now I am practicing, in the beginning I practiced a lot two hours a day, but now I'm reducing my practice because I'm trying to see more. Because if I practice too much, I stay very peaceful and calm uh, the whole day. But I'm trying to reduce more the time of practice so that I actually get a bit more triggered, so that the things affect me a bit more, so that I, have, I can work with those discomforts. Um, or my reactions to them because if I practice too much then then it, it's I have too much state of concentration of calm and the things don't bother me so it's there's different different ways um, of thinking about it but as a as a kind of blanket recommendation I would say if you do 30 minutes a day at least it's, it's already a great start yeah thank you so much for asking that question uh, I also have been uh, meditating about like 20, 30 minutes a day for a few years, but I found after 40 minutes, a lot, yeah, a lot of things, it's just like how you mentioned, a lot of things do come up and it just becomes more, more, more difficult to sit with it. Um, so I wanted to know in that case, if I feel like I'm entering this kind of like brain fog where uh, just like I can just feel this, these distracting thoughts just pop up to relieve myself of like my feelings would you ever recommend that I try to take a bit of a, a break and like kind of let myself re reset and like get back into the breath or how how would you suggest I deal with that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah um there's the best way to deal with that or the most direct way is just to be, if you can be clearly aware of what's happening in the mind and body mm -hmm. in that moment and not lose yourself in it and kind of stay and let the awareness kind of, let's say, be, is a bit like, a, like we are in water. And if you can just kind of bring your head above the water to, to see the things rather than drowning in the water, that's the, that's the sweet spot. Um, but if if so it depends on the magnitude if it, if you really feel it's like so intense um, and if you're not on retreat and specifically kind of like going for those moments then you can relax a bit but but i would say that if you have some schedule like okay i have 45 minutes every day you you stick to that and because you made some decision about okay i have 45 minutes you don't just kind of get up when it becomes hard on some days or not um, but let's say if it's so overwhelming every time, then you should probably reduce a bit the time. Okay, thank you. And I like the water metaphor a lot. So I'll remember that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we are kind of learning to swim. <laughs> yeah. To never get drowned in the in the overwhelm. Whatever it is. And so it's also not different from the rest of our life. Because in every moment in when we are out and about, when I'm talking right now, there is the state and there's activity in the body and the mind going on. And the more we can cultivate a habit to quickly switch into just the awareness of it, the easier it is to kind of let go and and not, not uh, fall into a spiral. <clears throat> Okay, what else is there? Yes, now I'm actually brainstorming. <clears throat> so I've had this course. This course has been at two hours a day for the 10 days of the last two years. And quite a lot of people drop out actually during the course. And I'm wondering how it would be if I reduce the time to maybe uh, 45 minutes, the sitting times, if that would be more accessible for the course. On the, on the other hand, of course, you don't, <clears throat> when you're meditating less, you, you get less um, insight into what that, what the longer meditation might bring you and give you. And after 10 days, if you, in the beginning, especially if you sat two hours and it's really difficult and then kind of becomes easier, you also start to see that you can relate differently to those things. Um, so I've been brainstorming that recently because now I have extra time to also maybe re-record the meditation. My, my um, thought to that would be, I'm glad that you set up this challenge because without it, I would not have experienced the effect of prolonged invitation. I, have, I wouldn't have met my meditation demons because like Kirsten uh, or Kristen, um, in the past, I always meditated in my sweet spot. So that kind of didn't happen to me. On the other hand, though, is that's why I'm glad actually that I asked the question on the middle of the course. You might want to explain at the beginning how hard it actually is to meditate for one hour and that it is okay to stop when the demons arise and then you know, try to get to 45 minutes, maybe challenge you once a while, 60 minutes, because without that background, it might feel like, oh, I'm not able to really sustain those 60 minutes twice a day. Um, therefore, I fail. Therefore, I drop out. It's. I think what you could do is just explain this in the beginning and explain that if it gets really, really difficult after 30 minutes, that that is okay. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because one of the things I, I also liked about this course is the fact that it's a longer duration than what I'm used to meditating. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, maybe, yeah, just like uh, Sean's suggestion here, like if you, there could be two versions of the recording, maybe one that would be a shorter version and then one for people who want to go the full hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That way people can have an option of like how much are they willing to really commit mm -hmm. at this time. Sure, sure. Thanks for the feedback. Thank you. Okay. It, by the way, if anyone still has anything about the technique or thing, now we're digressing a bit. <laughs> um, yeah, if you, if you want to ask. And by the way, that's that's exactly the thing which um, didn't have me uh, giving up on yoga. Um, you know, I'm in my mid 50s. I'm overweight. I'm not a typical yoga guy. And so in the beginning, it was terrifying for me to go to a yoga class with all this flexible younger people, mainly women. And there was me um, totally struggling. But um, the yoga teacher explained to me, just being here and trying is is what it really is about. And she encouraged me, if you find a pose too difficult, just go where your comfort is and then stop right there. You don't have to do the full bend and whatsoever. And that actually kept me going. And now it's, I mean, am I, um, you know, I'm still a beginner stage and a lot is still too challenging in yoga, but I've reached a stage where I literally enjoy this. So kind of having it not too gruesome in the beginning, but encouraging and then step by step, 
that I that's why I'm still doing yoga. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, lots of food for thought. <laughs> okay, from a scale of one to five, from the lecture from the lecture content. Uh, how clear, how clear is it to you in, from today's lecture? Okay, good. So there's no questions about the lecture. I had an interesting question, maybe one more thing. I had an interesting question about, uh, yeah, trauma. And when, when trauma or when you feel traumatic memories or things start to appear. So now that we move into the Vipassana technique, when we are using body sensations, so trauma is also stored in the body very intensively. And that when the trauma starts to appear, it can appear as a memory, a, a thought, a pattern of thinking, it can appear as um, some sort of self-narrative in your head, it can appear as a sensation in the body. So a very intense tightening or contraction or um, reactivity essentially that's stored in the body, that's stored in the nervous system. And it comes up <clears throat> maybe for no reason and maybe there's some small reason that kind of triggers it intensively. And that is um, also also happens in the everyday life. Maybe when something small happens and we overreact in, in very strong ways because we have some sort of trauma or memory, especially in the nervous system and the body that reacts in that because in the past something something very much more intense happened. And so in this technique, we're also as we are giving space. Um, to feel these different things in the body. So sometimes there's some sensations which appear, emotions, thoughts, um, and we're giving them space and we're allowing them to come up. So it's not about sitting in peacefulness the whole time. It's not about peacefulness, Vipassana. It's about allowing these things to surface and allowing um, ourselves to feel them. And over time, they get less and less powerful. And maybe in the beginning, you feel it really still influences your mind and your behavior. And over time, it almost barely surfaces or surfaces and then you immediately recognize it and you can let go of that specific sensation, thought, um, emotion. But the, most, the important thing for that is that we <clears throat> stay in a, in a zone of um, not being overwhelmed. So when we are really overwhelmed, we cannot, we cannot even do the technique. It's better to stand up and stop but if we can stay again with that head a little bit above the water to see it maybe it's unpleasant maybe it's uncomfortable but we're not freaking out that is progress and over time then we can um, bring our head more and more out of that water so to speak yes maybe that okay good so um Yes, there's still a few a few days left. We are we are halfway through the course, and now it becomes increasingly important to to do the practice. Now we start to understand what this is about. Um, the more there will be more Q and A sessions. I'll, I'll post a reminder, and um, on Saturday will be the another lecture where we talk a bit more about how we bring this practice into the daily life, how to continue practicing. Um, which will answer probably a few questions on your mind. Okay, so thank you very much for joining. And I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Raimo. Thank you.